didn't hear from our last meeting, so we'll be just a few minutes and we'll get started. Meeting will now come to order. Uh, Mayor and Pro Mayor Pro Tem not able to be with us tonight, so you're stuck with me. So please be patient with me. <laughs> First time I've had to do this. Uh, we have, I believe, we have uh, Robert's rules of order to follow here, Miss Crouch. We do, and what we need to do here in this instance, the council rules do not speak to when the mayor and the mayor Pro Tem are absent. So they do speak to Robert's rules of order. So you need to elect a, a presiding officer or temporary mayor pro tem for each of your two meetings this evening, a committee of the whole and and at the start of the regular meeting. So if you guys want to go forward and elect somebody and then we'll roll into the meeting. I nominate uh, Tommy Dawson to preside over the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we can proceed. Uh, we have the minutes from the last committee of the whole meeting. Move yep. for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass. And now I believe we're going to hear from the uh, city attorney, Ms. Crouch. That's correct. He's going to give a 2021 redistricting briefing along with we asked some guests this evening. May I remove my mask? I know Please. it's difficult. Sorry. Uh, at this time, I would like to... Um, 
submit to you that since our previous meeting, uh, two meetings ago actually, we've conducted additional analysis of the proposed or an alternate proposed map in addition to, uh, for our new districts, voting districts, in addition um, to the that analysis that was done by staff, we also referred the same to uh, legal counsel, who you've heard from previously, Mr. Dorman Walker, who um, also took my instructions and I asked him to try to draw maps or verify the map that had been submitted, the alternate map, as meeting legal criteria. Uh, in addition to those two processes, uh, Mr. Walker also employed a, an expert uh, witness, an expert in this area and field, who you'll hear from tonight, um, all in an effort to try to justify, verify, or confirm that the proposed map would be uh, legally without challenge. And I will turn over the presentation to <coughs> Mr. Walker uh, as he sees fit to address the concerns not only of our previous map and, and why it was, in his opinion, constitutional and legal, but also address the information and data that has been analyzed since the, we received the alternative map. <coughs> Just a point of information before Mr. Walker speaks that we'll roll into the regular council agenda, obviously be after 7 p.m. whenever we conclude Committee of the Whole at whatever time such happens. Okay. Thank you, council members. Um, I, was, I was asked to do two things two things, to advise the city uh, to review and comment on the map that was prepared by the city staff, and then to review and comment on any additional maps that were submitted to the city. And the only whole uh, plan additional map that was submitted to the city is, I think, what we'll call the NAACP plan is my understanding of that's who the author is. Um, with regard to, to the first map, the map that was produced by the city, I want to say that, that I think that the procedure the city used was exemplary. There were, there were several opportunities for members of the public to come and review the map. Uh, they could also review it online. They could interact with city staff if they had questions about the map. Uh, and in, in my experience, uh, it was an exemplary open procedure of map drawing. And I have looked at the map, I've talked with the staff about the map, and I believe that it complies with all of the legal requirements and that it is fully in compliant with the Voting Rights Act and with the Constitution. With regard to the NAACP, NAACP plan, I'd like for you first to hear from Dr. Uh, Trey Hood, who is here from the University of Georgia, where he's uh, in the political <coughs> science department first, about his analysis of the population numbers behind the Ward 6 uh, of the NAACP plan, which that, that plan seeks to have two uh, majority districts. Um, and one, one, of course, is, is Ward 1, which is not numerically a majority district, majority black district, but it functions as one because uh, many of the students who live in that district don't vote and because of some crossover voting. So that's good. Uh, Ward 6 is the proposed uh, crossover district, and um, I'd like for you to see Dr. Hood's analysis of that before I give you uh, my thoughts about that. So Dr. Uh, Trey Hood. You can just stand up at the podium, Dr. Hood, okay. and then he's got a remote for you. And there's the screen everywhere. Okay. Okay. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for having me again. I'm Trey Hood from the University of Georgia. I was asked to do some statistical analysis on the NAACP plan that was presented. So first off, just big picture here, this is for the city of Auburn, we're not dividing anyone into districts at this point, but you can see the racial breakdown of the city of Auburn, and VAP means voting age population. Um, I can barely see these numbers myself from here, so, but maybe. So what you can see here, and again, this is from, this is all census data. The city of Auburn is about 71% non-Hispanic white, VAP. 
And then if you add the minority groups together across the bottom, non-Hispanic Black, Hispanic, non-Hispanic Asian, and other, other would include uh, multiracial and American Indian, for instance. If you add all those together, you get about 29.3% minority voting age population. Now, if you look at another metric, which is important in this case, which is the citizen voting age population, slightly different picture emerges. Uh, again, so this is the 18, and 18 plus population who are citizens for the city of Auburn. Again, not dividing anyone yet into districts. Now you see 76% non-Hispanic white, 24.1% minority citizen voting age population. You can see how it breaks out into the specific um, minority groups there. Next, I've got it just a side-by-side -side of those two metrics. And you can see there's a, there's a fairly large drop-off uh, in the non-Hispanic Asian population, 8.1% voting age population, but down to 2.5% citizen voting age population. And that's what causes the uptick in the percentage figures for the non-Hispanic white population. Now, next, we're going to take a look at how things parse out on these two metrics, that is, voting age population and citizen voting age population. Uh, if you divide uh, people up into districts based on the NAACP plan, you can see that dark uh, line at 50% there, that horizontal line. So what we're looking at here is the percentage non-Hispanic white population, either VAP or CVAP again. So this is the easiest way to look at it. If the bar is below that horizontal black line, that, that would indicate a majority minority district, right? So for instance, District 1 voting age population is a majority minority district because it has less than 50% non-Hispanic white uh, citizens in that particular district. And so is D6. You can't really see it because D6 is just almost evenly split, but it is a majority-minority district using voting age population. But if you look at things in terms of citizen voting age population, and again, this would give you an idea of the potential electorate in these districts, a slightly different picture emerges where none of these districts are actually majority-minority. D1 comes close, but you can see D6 is far and away not a majority-minority district when you're looking at the CVAP population. So the next thing, hopefully, hopefully this is clear. I'm glad to answer questions when we get to the end of this, and this, this won't be too long. The next thing I, I took a look at is uh, testing for minority vote dilution. Now, these tests uh, were developed by the courts. They go back to about 1986. It's called the Jingles Test. And these are the different components here. These prongs are the different components of the Jingles Test. So specifically, prong one asks, is the, is the minority group sufficiently large and compact enough to form a majority in a single member district? Prong two, is the minority group politically cohesive? So meaning is the minority group voting together? Do they have a preferred candidate of choice? Can we identify a candidate that they're a majority behind, in other words? And this is a, this is a special note on coalition districts. What's been proposed here is essentially a minority coalition district. Usually Section 2 applies to single race groups, for instance, African Americans or Hispanics or Asians, but here, it's being proposed that a coalition uh, district be drawn, which is comprised of basically everyone who's non-Hispanic white. And so in that case, to reach prong two, you'd have to demonstrate that all the minority groups are voting cohesively for the same candidate. They're all voting in the same direction, in other words. So that's important. And then prong three asks the question, if you can find prong two, you go to prong three, which asks the question, is the preferred minority candidate of choice typically defeated by a majority white block vote? So that's the third part of this. And to sustain a vote dilution claim, you need all three of these prongs, not just one or two of them. So looking at prong one, 
my assessment again, which is based on these data here, especially the citizen voting age population, my assessment on prong one is that the, looking at the CVAT population, uh, none of the city council districts, again, this is just sort of recapping what I said, proposed in this particular plan would function, effectively function, as majority minority districts. And then moving on to prong two, which requires some statistical analysis because what you're trying to do is, is determine what direction specific racial groups are voting for which candidates. So I analyzed the 2018 mayor's race because again, it's a nonpartisan race at the local level. The 2014 mayor's race was uncontested, so there was nothing to analyze there. So this was the most proximate, um, what was called an endogenous or probative election to take a look at this particular plan. Now, one caveat, and we can talk about this more, there's only four precincts to analyze, which gives us very little statistical power. But the takeaway point is looking at the mayor's race or the mayor's runoff race, the statistical analysis that I performed does not provide evidence that whites and other minority groups have different preferred candidates of choice. So here, sometimes this is called racially, we're looking for racially polarized voting. Are minority groups voting in one direction for one candidate and white voters voting in another direction for another candidate? Cannot find sustained statistical evidence for that in either one of these races that was analyzed. So my takeaway point here, the conclusion under prong two, is there's no statistical evidence of racially polarized voting patterns for these elections that were analyzed. So moving on to prong three, again, if prong two is not sustained, there's really no evidence of prong three. If we can't tell that there is racially polarized voting or not, it's hard to say that there is specifically for one, a minority preferred candidate of choice who's being defeated by a majority white voting bloc. So the overall takeaway points or conclusions here is that I was unable to find any evidence statistically speaking, to sustain any of the three jingles prongs. And again, you need all three of them to sustain a vote dilution claim. So my major takeaway point here from this analysis is that there's not any evidence of minority vote dilution as related to the City of Auburn City Council districting scheme. So I don't know if you want me to answer questions now or wait or... Do you have any questions for him before he'll be available throughout the Committee of the Whole? But at this time, do you have any questions, Council? Uh, the relevance on the jingles test, that's if, if this were to be challenged, the math that's being proposed, that would be what would be challenged. Uh, uh, allegations of vote dilution, is that, is that what well, we that, to the jingles that's, test? That's one. It could be, and again, uh, Mr. Mr. Walker can speak to this. That's more of a legal issue. But there could be a vote dilution claim. There could be a 14th Amendment <clears throat> racial gerrymandering claim. Right. So, we, and what is the, and you mentioned VAP and CVAP or, or vo voter age population and citizen voter age. Why is, it, why is that really relevant here in our analysis when we're looking at maps in the data you showed? Well, it's, it's relevant if the citizen voting age population diverges from the voting age population. Because again, you're drawing a district, you're trying to, if you're trying to draw a minority, majority minority district and it can't really function that way, because of a number of non-citizens in that district, then you're not really drawing a majority-minority district in the end. So that could affect analysis too, if we were to take just 18 over that could vote, but not necessarily account for citizenship, that could skew the numbers. Is that what, is that fair or affect the? Well, you need to look at the CVAT population, sure. yes, in this case. In some, <coughs> some cases, it, it doesn't matter. <coughs> If the voting age population and the citizen voting age population are analogous, it wouldn't really matter that much. Uh, but in this case, there is a drop off for certain uh, minority groups, especially uh, non-Hispanic Asians in this case. And one, from, one more for me. The, you mentioned coalition, multiple different types of racial groups kind of voting in uh, together. Is that an automatic, is that by default in your experience with other areas or is that going to be candidate related? I mean. Does that always happen? Where you see no, it doesn't always emerge that way, and, sure. and it has to be shown statistically. If, I mean, from for what I'm doing, it has to be shown statistically that it does exist. Mm -hmm. So, but that wasn't you didn't. I didn't find evidence of that. No. Thank you. 
Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you. So at, at this point, I'm going to be, I think, a little bit repetitive, but I think it, 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 it bears it. The city's plan uh, complies, in my opinion, with the Voting Rights Act and with the Constitution and fulfills the city's obligation to redistrict itself based on the 2020 census data. Um, unfortunately, the NAAC plan does not. Um, it can't meet the numerosity requirement, as shown by Dr. Hood, uh, and, and the question that you ask about the difference between voting age population and CVAP is a very good one. Normally, when we're dealing with a minority uh, district, it's just black or white here in Alabama because those are the ethnic groups that we principally have. And we know all of those people are citizens. But in this case, uh, a large part of the population for the proposed Ward 6 was an Asian uh, population and non-Hispanic Asian, and as uh, Dr. Hood showed you, that that dropped from 8.1% uh, when we looked merely at voting age population to 2.5%, and that's important for two reasons. One is because it's part of the reason that that the the proponents of that plan can't show that it could it could function as a minority majority district, but also if the Asian population drops from 8.1 voting age population to 2.5 citizen voting age population, then it's fair to assume that those majority of Asian population that are not citizens are not engaged in a political coalition with, with uh, the other minority groups in the proposed Ward 6. There's, so there's not only the, no evidence uh, been presented of a coalition of all those disparate minority groups, that, no evidence that the, uh, the Hispanic uh, voters and the Asian voters and the black voters and the other minority group voters vote together, uh, support and contribute to the same candidates, but also we know that, that a, a substantial number of the Asian population isn't even in the game at all because they're not citizens. So for those two reasons alone, I would say that the plan is, is, does not comply with the Voting Rights Act or the Constitution. It merely groups people together because of their ethnicity. A third, um, there's no evidence of racially polarized voting. There's no evidence that uh, in municipal elections, whites vote uh, in one direction and the minority votes in the other. In fact, it appears from the evidence submitted by um, Dr. Hood that there is some crossover voting by whites in support of, of, of Councilman Finch Taylor in Ward 1, which is good. Um, so, so in sum, there's no evidence of Section 2 vote dilution. And finally, Ward 6 was admittedly drawn, uh, we heard that on December 21, in a race-conscious manner, which is not, which is not permitted. So based on, on these reasons, I would say that it does not comply uh, with the Voting Rights Act and the Constitution. Let me add also that with regard to, to the, the first point I raised, which is the number of minorities and the fact that there's not enough minority members in the proposed uh, second minority majority district, the city staff tried to create on its own a second uh, majority district with a sufficient number of minority members and they just weren't able to do it. And that indicates to me that it's simply not possible to do given the demographics of Auburn today. In 10 years, who knows what will happen given the population growth in this city and maybe in 10 years you'll be able to have two minority districts. But I don't think that you can create a second minority district now and comply with the Voting Rights Act and the Constitution. I'll be glad to take any questions. Questions from Mr. Walker? Mr. Walker, um, <clears throat> this body's received a number of emails, um, specifically questioning your credentials and your associations. I think it's only fair that you have the opportunity to speak to those criticisms from the public, and I wonder if you could share with us um, your experience 
and uh, the, the, the particular criticisms aimed at you about an association with uh, a, a political operative by the name of Thomas Hoffler. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to that. Um, there were some comments made, I think it was at the January 4 meeting, which I was not here, about a Mr. Hoffler. And the short of it is that, that he was um, a person who uh, was prominent, I think it's fair to say, in Republican, Republican redistricting circles. He, I believe, in the 2010 um, redistricting cycle, uh, he helped in some way or another draw the plans for a number of states, including um, North Carolina, which, which is sort of like, if, if the Yankees are the Yankees of baseball, North Carolina is, is the Yankees of redistricting. It's just, it's, it's, there's more litigation there about redistricting than any other state, I think. And there's, been, there's one district there, Congressional District 12, that's been in the Supreme Court about five or six times. So it's, that's what, he, he assisted there. Um, I met Mr. Huffletter, Huffler uh, one time um, I think it was at a redistricting conference that the National Conference of State Legislators had uh, before the start of the 2010 cycle. Um, we talked. He told me uh, that he was in communication with a lot of people about redistricting, and I was at that time working on revising or making sure that the state's guidelines for redistricting complied with legal developments that had happened in the intervening six, 10 years since I had last revised the guidelines. Uh, and he said he'd be glad to look at them since he looked, worked in many states. I sent them to him, he looked at them, he didn't make any changes, or at least he didn't make any substantive changes. Um, and I think that was, uh, Maybe we had a few other emails after that. My last emails were hit with him were in 2011. Um, in 2018, I think he died, and I didn't know this until recently. Um, after he died, his daughter, from whom he apparently was estranged, uh, got copies of computer files of his that, that betrayed some um, fairly, I think, egregious positions with regard to how redistricting could be used to steal votes from um, from Democrats and from minority groups, and perhaps some some uh, racist views too. Needless to say, I didn't have any conversation with Mr. Huffler about any of that back in when I met him. When I think uh, 2010, or in the few emails we exchanged in 2011, um, and and I, I, I don't obviously believe that those are the appropriate things to do. I think redistricting should be done in a way that makes our democracy function. And I, I certainly think that we have to be very vigilant in the protection of minority voting rights in order to have a democracy. And I believe that the plan that the city staff has drawn does that. But thank you for letting me address that. Thank you. I have more questions. I got, I just got one question. <clears throat> yes, um, you mentioned crossover voting mm -hmm. for Ward one, can you explain that? Yes, ma'am. When I was looking at the uh, the, at the numbers that um, Dr. Hood put up, that He's showed we're going to put them back up real quick. You want the which chart do you want? The the chart. He can roll through them just a second. Yeah, and not tell that him one. When to stop. I'll go back. The double that one. I may have been wrong because I think I was looking at that without realizing it was NAACP plan. But I, I, I think, I, I wonder if you might not get uh, crossover voting in your context would be white support for, for you. And I, I think you must get some in order to, to be, I mean, your district has consistently returned um, a, 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 a black candidate to the city council, despite the fact that, in fact, there's a minority of, of, of black people in the population. So part of that's due, I think, to citizens, I mean, to, to, to the fact that there's a lot of students in your districts who don't vote, as I understand it. And part of it, I think, is that you get, as you should, support from white, white people who live in the district. <clears throat> now, okay, so you say that, but, I mean, how can you tell... Uh, I guess when people go in and they um, vote, so they fill out this little form, you know, saying that they're coming in to vote, but how can you tell 
the blacks voting? Who, who? I, I could be wrong. I was just basing that on the fact that there's a minority of, of black voters in your district, yet you win. So you must be getting some additional support, is what I was saying. But the numbers are so low in Ward 1. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how, how did you determine um, – did you determine that from the numbers? Because I think in 2018, and I could be wrong, uh, the um, Ward 1 had about 6,500 people, and there was only maybe 600 people that voted. Even for between me and the two candidates, they run. So how how can you determine? And I'm not saying they didn't. Yeah. I, yeah. I was just trying to figure out how did how was that determined that all the votes could have been all blacks, or some of the votes could have been, you know, mixed let, in. So how was that determined to say that I got a crossover vote? Let um, let me be clear. I did not do a full analysis of of your district. It was just something that I thought from looking at the numbers. It may be that there's not any crossover voting and the reason that you win is, is because the students don't vote. I don't really know. Okay. I, 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 would just, I just want to clarify that. Okay. <clears throat> but that, what, what I do just know... Just there were some numbers out there. I, I like to see how, you know, when you go behind, when you stick that little thing in there, I they understand. ask you for race or anything like this. I was just trying to figure out how, how did you... I think, I think the golden standard on that would be the exit polling. Uh, which which is which has never been done here, and um, but I, what I do know is that is that your district consistently performs as a minority majority district, even though technically it's not one. So that's good. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Did you have anything else? At this time, I'm, yeah, there's a microphone right there. At this time, I don't have any additional information for the council. Um, I do know that we've. Not only did we ask for additional data or evidence to help analyze the proposed map, which we never got, the city staff endeavored to, to cre recreate the map in a, in a legal way and couldn't do it. And then separately and distinctly, uh, so did Mr. Walker and, and still can't get to a legally defensible map um, other than the one that the city manager proposed. So that, in conclusion, is... A sit the situation we find ourselves in is at least legally and the fear I have is that if you create a map that does not function practically with minority districts and, and, and they're not possible to function because citizens, the, the, the voters you're relying on to make those districts are not citizens and can't vote, then you've created a situation that has diluted both Ward 1 and 6 to the point that there may not be any minority candidates elected and that is a great risk in my legal view. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Questions on the agenda, City Manager Crouch? May I have an opportunity to ask city staff a question about this, this, uh, the city's, the work that went involved into the city map? Mr. Dawson, you're good, right, with that? I'm fine with that. If it's Absolutely. Yep. Legal counsel will stop us at a point, but go ahead and pose it, and I'll, I'll choose the staff member to help answer. I know it was briefly touched on uh, in this uh, presentation, um, but I would like, if, if it is at all possible, for the staff to comment about the attempts that they made to satisfy the requirements of a second minority district. Mr. Graff and Mr. Kipp, would you like to respond? Um, yeah, so, so most definitely this was an exercise we pursued, and we pursued it in multiple different ways. You know, we, we looked at individual minorities. Um, obviously, there are not numerous enough nor compact enough to uh, serve in that way. Uh, and then we also looked at uh, these coalition minority groups. Um, but you know, as we talked about with the jingles, um, we were just unable to find a practical way to put them together that wasn't then violating um, any of these other boundaries that we have to work within. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that members of the audience heard heard that aspect of the work that's gone on in, in creating this map. Yeah. Appreciate it. And I'd also like to just touch on um, several hundred hours of staff time has been spent evaluating the 
the alternative map that was proposed by the NAACP, um, and much care and time was taken to evaluate every bit of it to make sure you no know, data was missed on our end. Was there anything we could do? And to, to Mr. Graff's point, we looked very early on at the city as a whole, um, and we looked again and again into December and this early part of January. So I want to be clear that a lot of time and effort was spent, as it should have been, on, on the alternative map that was submitted, and we looked at a proof of concept map prior to that. Um, uh, but the clarity we were provided by the NAACP was to focus once the alternative map was submitted to focus on that, which we did. Um, and I just want to be clear, a lot of time and effort was spent um, intentionally um, and with great effort to be sure that we had evaluated it thoroughly. Thank you. Mr. Griswold, did you have? Uh, yes. Uh, there was a, a statement saying that some data was not provided by the NAACP that we had requested. Could you elaborate on that, please? Mr. Davidson. Certainly. We we endeavor to, to analyze any evidence of cohesion, any evidence of, of the requirements that were articulated at the previous meeting in Jingles to meet a Section 2 analysis. Uh, but admittedly, even from the podium previously, that evidence wasn't there. It wasn't submitted to the council. The first time you heard that map, we, we gave ample time for that to be produced. And when it wasn't produced, we simply tried to do it internally and, and externally and to no avail. So I'm fairly confident that it, it's not there. So it's predominantly evidence of cohesion of, um, amongst the various minority groups that constituted the alternative map. Alternative map. Right. And as, okay. as, as right. I would suggest, it's more of an aggregate of groups as it is cohesion. Gotcha. There is no cohesion. The alternate is, is what's happening. They're being aggregated with no evidence that they function cohesively. Okay. Thank you. Correct. And I think the response was, if I recall, that it was cohesion, um, that it was up to the... Uh, asked the question again for evidence, and the response was something of the effect of um, that was on the city to provide such the response or to find the information we presented to you. We have tried every bit um, to prove voter cohesion, and we have been un unable to do that. One of our challenges has been that um, you don't get to insert your opinion as much as you would like to when we're doing a raw data analysis and looking at the law, or we're, what we're looking for is in the data to prove one way or the other, and, and people would say, well, inherently, I, this is what I think about the citizens of Auburn or, or different groups or whether they're cohesive or not. We were looking for data to back that up of, of what, which we could not find. Um, and again, staff is in an advising mode on this. We are evaluating based on our technical expertise, and you've heard from multiple experts about um, they have been employed in part through the city attorney to also find this information as we had been asked to do and we have not been able um, to prove that in any form or fashion at this time. I have one other question. Yes, sir. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been in attendance in a number of uh, presentations of the alternative map provided by the NAACP. One of their uh, assertions is that uh, regarding gerrymandering, that um, gerrymandering is legal if it's done to, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, one of their assertions is, as I understand it to be, that, paraf uh, that uh, gerrymandering can be considered legal if it supports a minority body or a minority voting bloc. Is, is that something that a microphone has there, substance and has merit? What, what the Supreme Court has said is that when we draw districts now, um, I mean, it, it, it's in, in, in the past, you would start with the minority majority district and draw that, but the Supreme Court has changed the law over time. And what they say now is that maps should be drawn race blind. And then at the end, when you have your final map, you can look at race and see if there is a strong basis in evidence for taking race-based steps that predominate over the traditional districting criteria in order to to uh, create what should be a, um, a minority minority district, but but that is not the circumstance that we have here. Thank you. Anything else? I hear a move for adjournment. So moved. All right, we adjourn. This time we'll go into our regular call meeting.
Councilperson Dawson, why don't we go into a roll call and then we'll go procedurally to yeah, I was fixing chair meeting. Uh, okay. Uh, Lindsay, can you call the roll, please? Dawson? Here. Dixon? Here. Griswold? Here. Hovey? Here. Parsons? Here. Smith? Present. Taylor? Here. Witten? Anders? All right, at this time, do we have a motion for uh, who's going to fill in for Ron? Yeah, per Robert's rules, just to reiterate in case somebody's out of the room, the mayor and the mayor pro tem are absent this evening, and so therefore the council just got to elect somebody to preside over the meeting this evening. I nominate the esteemed uh, council member from Ward 8, uh, Tommy Dawson, to preside over the meeting. I have a second. Second. Okay. Thank you. Second Let me vote. say this is, I uh, hope I do a good job tonight, but this is a thrill for me to be able to preside over Auburn City Council <laughs> meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm 56 years old, been Auburn all my life, and... Uh, uh, I never dreamed a country boy from Cox Road would be presiding over a city council meeting. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a it's kind of a, it's, it means something to me. I just put it that way. I, I care about Auburn deeply, and it means something to me to be up here doing this. So uh, thank you, and be patient with me, please. We, we hadn't voted for you yet. Yeah, we need to vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good campaign speech, though. <laughs> well, uh, you, you better vote for me. <laughs> All right, do, uh, uh, we have all in favor say aye. 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 Excuse me, all you got me on that one. <laughs> it's pretty funny. All right, uh, now join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. That's awesome. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, committee of the whole tonight, we uh, we heard from uh, uh, City Attorney Rick Davison, and he uh, brought uh, Mr. Walker with him to talk about redistricting. And uh, the professor from Georgia, we won't hold that against you being you from Georgia, uh, but uh, appreciate you. I appreciate that. Appreciate you being <laughs> over here. Uh, and uh, that's what we did in the community hall. We had a uh, executive meeting before, executive session before the meeting. We were a little late getting here, but uh, that's all I have on that. Any announcements from the? I don't have any announcements. Does the rest of the council have any announcements? Mr. Griswold. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just an announcement, uh, the cost to the city for the Dixon versus City of Auburn lawsuit is $55,428.91 as of the 31 December 2021. Any more announcements? All right, we'll move into uh, Auburn University Communications. <clears throat> I hope y'all are doing well. Y'all probably noticed students are back because the roads are busier and it takes longer to get everywhere. So um, classes are in full swing, second week. We're excited about that. And y'all probably also heard Auburn is number two in basketball now. Barely, barely made it, but um, we're trying to get all the students to go to all athletic events, not just football. So we're also working on a student section in the baseball stadium so that students can congregate in their own section. Um, and then lastly, the presidential candidate, uh, Dean Christopher Roberts, is visiting um, to do a forum where students can get to know him and ask him questions just about his position and how he's the only single candidate now for Auburn's new president. So that's pretty much all I have. Um, I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, War Eagle. War Eagle. All right, now we're going to move into citizens' communication on agenda items. Again, this is, uh, you have five minutes to speak to the council. This is for anything that might be on the agenda. Uh, if you want to speak now, or some of them hold a public, have a public hearings when it, it comes up. But if you want to speak to anything else that does not have a public hearing, uh, now's the time to do it, and you have five minutes to do so. Anybody wish to just to address the council right now? All right. That, no, no one step forward. Uh, City Manager Crouch for City Manager Communications. All right, Temporary Mayor Dawson. Here we go. Our first item of business is the consent agenda. Does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and deal with that item individually? 
All right. All in favor of the consent agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. I need a motion. Move for approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody oppose it? All right. And then we move on to ordinances. Under ordinances this evening, item 9A1 is a request from Jay Torbett and Nancy T. Henry to annex approximately 10.51 acres located on the east side of Lee Road 958, approximately 0.35 miles south of Moores Mill Road. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval at its January 13th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. Anybody here have a reason we can't move forward with this tonight? None being seen. I don't see anybody that does. So uh, now we. Uh, any questions? Any questions on discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a question on the item. Uh, are there any plans to extend city water or sewer to this region, to this area of the city? No. Nothing forthcoming. Okay. All right. I, and I noticed in the public safety comments, um, I raised some concerns about fire and police coverage. Both seem to be a little bit limited. Uh, the fire being more than five miles from the closest fire station and police jurisdiction have delayed response time. So those are two concerns of mine. Mr. Register, do you have any, anything to add to that? Uh, that area is, we have a you know, police unit assigned to that area, so I would think the response time would be, you know, between five and ten minutes typically on a call to that location. Uh, the Ogletree Fire Station could service that area. Uh, obviously, it would be a little longer than some of the things on Morris Mill Road, but it, it is serviceable, but could be a little longer. Mr. Foote, there are adjacent uh, properties, obviously, that are currently in the city limits. Is that correct? Uh, there are, it's on the map that's in the packet, mm -hmm. the cross-hatched areas, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So this area would be serviced by the um, Beauregard Volunteer Fire Department, right? Just to follow up on Griswold's question there. Even if it's in the city limits, would Beauregard... If, it, if it's in the city limits, the Auburn Fire Department is going to service if, if it's in the city limits. But with our... Pursuant to our mutual aid agreement, they would. Would that be typical to dispatch them to, to something in there, so close it, to there? The Auburn Fire Department would be the primary on anything in the city, but yes, mutual aid would be available from the Borgard Fire Department. Okay. And in areas like this, they typically work together. Yes, sir. That is correct. They would they would likely be a mutual response, and just whoever got there first would deal with the situation. But they they work together regularly in that in that area. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I hear a motion. You're good. You just need to vote. Lindsay, call the roll, please. Dawson. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Griswold. No, ma'am. Hovey. Yes, ma'am. Parsons. Yes. Smith. Yes, ma'am. Taylor. Yes. Item 9A2 is a request from Blake Rice on behalf of McWhorter Properties and Society Hill Estates LLC to annex approximately 48.5 acres located on the north side of Society Hill Road near the intersection of Society Hill Road and Moores Mill Road. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval at its January 13th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. No second. Second. Anybody have a reason we shouldn't move forward this ordinance tonight? None being, uh, nobody that does, so uh, discussion. Hearing none, uh, Lindsay called a row. Dixon? Yes. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Hovey? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Smith? Yes, ma'am. Taylor? Yes. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Item 9B is the 2021 redistricting plan that reapportions city council districts following a federal decennial census as required by, the, by Alabama State Statute 1143A-33. This item was postponed and the public hearing continued from both the January, or great, sorry, December 21st meeting as well as the January 4th meeting. Move for approval. You're already, uh, it's already on the table. You were just, okay. you have a, 
a postponement that it's on the table for business. It's whether or not you guys would like to have discussion prior or any questions prior to opening the public hearing. Discussion now or after the public meet. We've got a question, procedural question. Sure. Uh, what was the deadline you gave us before needing this to be in place before the upcoming elections? This. So, so just kind of to going back, we have to have this published um, in the newspaper by February 22nd. And backing up from that, the paper of general circulation in Auburn is often considered the villager. When we advertise going into the December 21st meeting, we advertised in both the Auburn Villager and the Opelika Auburn News just to be sure citizens had maximum communication. So there are advertising deadlines associated with this. I've been asking you to consider having this complete um, by our very first February meeting. If we go to the second meeting in February, and I believe that is February 15th, the February 1st meeting would be the first meeting. We would have to have legal ads submitted to the papers to make a publishing deadline to meet a, a six month prior to the municipal election criteria set forth in state law. And we would have to submit those ads before the meeting and trying to guess at what the council would do. So really it is the February 1st meeting. That would be the um, deadline would be the deadline. It would be up to the city attorney if we could only advertise in the Opelika Auburn News. They have a little shorter deadlines, but it depends on what day of the week that, that you hit. Um, and all of our newspapers have been great partners, but they struggle as publishing plants have been moving out of this area and get further away. Their deadlines are, it's a longer lead time for us um, with their deadlines, and that's a no choice situation for them. But um, we often need almost close to a full week out to get things in, into a paper a week later. For clarification, when you say uh, the deadline for publishing, what is exactly that we're publishing? And I'll have the Mr. Da yes, the well, when Mr. Davidson will correct me if I'm in, if I'm incorrect, when we, when the council adopts an ordinance um, and you're changing, say something like the zoning ordinance, an easier example, it has not become effective, and you dealt with this with short-term rentals and other things, until it is pu published. It has to be published in a newspaper of general circulation. So you're noticing to the public that we have adopted a, a new law, a, a procedure of sorts, or what have you. And so we can't make it usually effective the day you adopt it. Um, it's effective upon publication. And so state law is saying um, for this to be effective, it must be published six months prior to the municipal election. But to confirm, if we were to adopt this on the first meeting in February, we'd be good timing-wise to have it for the upcoming election. Good timing. Also, upon publication, the ordinance that is in your packets is a legal description, and Mr. Graff will assist me with this. That legal description runs further than your maps show, and the reason that they do is if we annex, it runs to county lines. Um, if we annex property along the way, it has to have a district that that it belongs in um, but we can't anticipate who's going to annex and who's not going to annex and that's how our our current districting um, is done so we do have to have time should the map change to get a le legal description written that is accurate to what the council adopted prior to publication so yeah it's a lot complicated but yes february 1st is ample time with with miss witten and uh the mayor absent uh for health reasons i without them having a voice in the process, I, I believe it'd be responsible or reasonable for us to, to move this to that meeting in February uh, in hopes that we have the full council here to deliberate and vote. And as such, I'd, I'd move now to postpone this to a date certain of, is it, I don't know the date, what is the? Are you looking for February 1st? There was also, I had been asked about it January 25th, which is next Tuesday. Yeah, I like to say, uh, um, would that be a special called meeting? Be a called meeting just about this topic. Right, because the, the, if I'm not mistaken, the first one in February is kind of full now, isn't it? You have you've moved the meeting time up um, to accommodate uh, several other very large items that got postponed on December 21st at, request, at the request of the applicants, not, not the council. Um, and those are some large development projects that are also on that agenda on February 1st. Well, it's it, certainly up it's, to the council. I think it's very important that we go ahead and, and hear, have a, a meeting on this, a special call meeting on the 25th, which will be next Tuesday, I believe. To, uh, do we have a motion to do? How, how will we do that, Megan? To well, you have a few choices this evening. You can open the public hearing or not. Um, you, you can po postpone it straight to a date date certain and we'll set a time. Um, you could also open the public hearing and then postpone it if that's what you're wanting to do or somebody's wanting to make that motion. It's certainly up to the council how you'd like to proceed with I'll that. Just tie them. Everybody's in agreement with open the public hearing and then we'll. Before we actually have a motion and a to vote, I'd like to ask another question, if that's all right. Yeah, we'll have a discussion at the public hearing. Okay. You have one question before? On yeah, I still have a question on procedure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, 
if we have a special meeting um, on the 25th, next yes. week, what is the advertising requirements for us to have that special meeting? If, well, I mean, let, me, let me back a minute. If in the event we have a special meeting and some changes are proposed, at that time we still have to republish what we're considering for the final vote. Is that correct? That's very challenging. I mean, Mr. Davidson needs to help me along. The, the, a, a week from now, if you were to postpone a week from now, we wouldn't have advertised any other map other than right. the one that was advertised in the month of December. Right. Um, it, depending on what the changes are, I don't know. This is not the same as the zoning ordinance where um, you dealt with this with, with another item a year ago where we had to re-advertise because substantive changes were made. I think the purpose of this advertisement, and Mr. Walker may weigh in as well, is um, the, the purpose of advertising it was to be sure that the public was properly noticed that you were considering redistricting. I don't know if that map that was advertised was just a map, not a legal um, description. And I don't know from our legal team if a full wholesale change would have to be re-advertised. That is a question I cannot answer. If there's a... <clears throat> Excuse me, if there's a proposed change, that needs to be submitted. If someone can draw it or has a submission, that would need to be uh, done in advance of the meeting. It's my belief that if there's a substantive change where a major line is redrawn or there's a big number of citizens moved, then yes. If it moves 10 people from one to another or one side of the street to the next over a block and there's legitimate reason for that, I don't think that that's going to be subject to criticism legally. But I do think if it changes the balance of the... Um, uh, I don't know that that r r r rises to the level of gerrymandering. I wouldn't be as concerned about that as if it was a wholesale. Okay. Mr. Davidson, though, the, the question is just about legal advertising. One thing is for us to be able to evaluate a change against all the, the criteria, but advertising specifically, which I think Councilperson Griswold is asking if, about, just the legal advertising component of it, let alone the analysis side. We, we if can, there is a change, you know, what well, is the lead? What, what does that do to us time-wise uh, so that we can still meet your final publication date of the 22nd? If we have another map for whatever reason. Can, can I, can, we can adopt amendments at that meeting on this map. You could, but you're going to have to republish. I mean, you're yeah, gonna, we're going to have post, to analyze post, it. We're okay. going to have to analyze it, and then you're going to have to make sure it, it is ultimately uh, advertised if it meets all the criteria. Before I mean, consideration or published. That is, Publish. yeah. So he, you're speaking to advertising, and the question ultimately is, we've already advertising that redistricting, the council was con officially considering a map as of December 21st. From there forward, if changes are proposed by the council, we don't have to re-advertise that. If I'm understanding our legal team correctly, that we do not have to re-advertise, but what we do have to do is have adequate time to analyze any potential changes against the criteria you've heard much about and make sure we can advise you accordingly um, prior to your consideration for adoption um, so that you have that information before you because what we can't do is um, if we got out of whack with the deviations that are required or, or other redistricting criteria, we have to be sure we're advising you accordingly. So if we, if we were to have a special session or a special called meeting on this subject alone, that would give us two cracks at this if we didn't resolve it at that special meeting next week because we still could, within the time frame you're saying by February 1st. It would. And I don't know that our legal team has, has answered this question. We're challenged because our municipal election happens to be this August. If you don't redistrict at all, if you don't meet these deadlines, I don't know if our legal team could speak to what the implications of that are because we are running up against a deadline because you would leave, as we know, Ward 2 has 14,000 people in it. Um, you're, you're leaving wards that are very disproportionate when, when you had census data. If you choose not to act, then the, the map pr proposed by the city manager becomes the district map. Within six opinion. months. Right. Mm -hmm. But not in time for this election. Well, no, no, I believe it is the map for this election because it was proposed prior there, too. Yeah, there's a six-month criteria. I think we would have to look on the fly. We need to get back to you about that piece of it. Well, wouldn't we do better to have the special call meeting on the 25th and, and if this just to vote on this proposal? If it's rejected, then you got more time to, to, uh, to come up with something different or, or see which way we go. Yeah, I think it's purely at the pleasure of the council. What we want to make sure and we need to be, you know, very succinct about is you're, you're the elected body. This is your call, and we're here to provide you any information you need to make a decision. 
about those districts. So we're happy to pivot as much as we need to to get you the information you need to make a decision. And so if that means meeting on January 25th and then you decide you still need more time, February 1st is the last time I can recommend to you, especially if you think you might make any changes, um, that is still giving us a very tight window to get all of this done and we would work diligently to do so, but it is getting dangerously close to a very difficult time frame for us to meet, um, to meet all of the deadlines for publishing beyond February 1st. We stick to February 1st, we, we will do everything we can to make it happen. Any other procedural questions? The August 23 is a movable, correct? Municipal election date. There's, we yeah, are it's duty not bound. Mr. Dorton. Not movable, correct? Yeah. Anything else? I, I re renew my motion. Uh, I'd like to move to, to postpone this to a date certain of January 25th. Um, I, I don't necessarily know what time. Uh, do you need a time? Is there? It's helpful to have it. I would recommend you consider because of people's work schedules, um, not earlier than five, but maybe five thirty makes it a little bit easier for you all to get here, and for the public. No, I post, uh, propose five thirty. To a... second. Call the roll. Yeah, motion and second. Any discussion? Any discussion? I I, I just want to ask the question. Okay, even. With, with uh, the proposal you just made. Um, but we're still going to have the public hearing tonight. That's something you all need to decide. Yes, yeah. I, that's okay. my intention. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's all I needed. So you have a choice. You could also open a public hearing. You can act, you know, act on this motion now and then open the public hearing. Or, Mr. Davidson, do you have a preference? It's fine. Either way, you want to do it. We got a motion and a second. Do we call the roll on this or just to... Uh, you can voice vote it, and if you need to call the roll on it, you can. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right. It's approved, then it'll be moved to the 25th at 5.30 p.m. And then are you going to open the public hearing? Yes. Uh, then? Or hmm? No. You now. About, you talking about Friday or, or? Now is what I think Councilperson Taylor was asking. Yeah, we're gonna, we, we can do it right now. All right, at this time we've opened public hearing. If anybody wants to address the council on this redistricting uh, motion, uh, step forward. Hello, my name is Tabitha Eisner. I reside at 4349 White Acres Road, Montgomery, Alabama, 36106. And I am here tonight as a in the role of uh, expert for the NAACP on mapping. Um, and I uh, thank you so much for having us and for continuing to give this topic um, your time and attention. We are very grateful for your engagement. Um, I wanna start by talking about um, sort of the, the very, the, the most basic question um, <coughs> at the heart of today's discussion, and that is what it means for a map to be legal. Um, so in order for a map to be legal, uh, the, uh, the rules say, the federal rules say, the districts must have an equal population, um, and they must comply, the map as a whole must comply with the Voting Rights Act. Um, any map, literally any way that you sliced it, you could slice it like a pinwheel, you could slice it in any way you wanted, all of you could be moved to all new districts. And it would still be a legal map if the districts are equally sized and if it does not violate uh, the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act specifically says that a map should not dilute the voting power of minorities. What does that mean? It, it is absolutely contentious what that means. It is not a simple matter to answer that question of what map does and doesn't dilute the voting power of minorities or the power of minorities to elect representatives of their choosing. So our map is legal. It's legal. The districts are evenly sized. It does not hurt minorities 
It does not dilute the ability of minorities to elect a representative of their choosing. Our map is legal. And I find it very bizarre that it's being presented as if it's not a legal map. Um, so I'd love to, I'd love to hear um, more about what makes it not legal. Um, the, the voting, so let's, let's talk some more about the Voting Rights Act. So the Voting Rights Act, uh, pardon my mask wearing, I had COVID recently, so I'm not gonna take it off uh, for everyone's safety. Um, the Voting Rights Act does not require that municipalities do the absolute bare minimum. That's not what the Voting Rights Act says. The Voting Rights Act says that you can't dilute the power of the minority group to elect a candidate of their choosing if they have adequate political power in their community to elect a candidate of their choosing. So um, it is perfectly allowable under the Voting Rights Act to create additional districts where minorities have an opportunity to elect a candidate of their choosing, um, even when uh, it may not be required to do so. So uh, it's, it's not a law that sets a ceiling on how many seats can be made available to minorities, it is a law that sets the floor. At bare minimum, you must have one district, or at bare minimum, you must have two districts. And again, to actually, to actually determine whether Auburn needs to have one minority district or two minority districts is, a, is gonna be a hot, hot contest, a hot debate. Um, it is not simple. Um, there's not a, a single way to determine that. Um, there are the Gingles preconditions, right? Those three preconditions you keep hearing about. But those preconditions are arbitrated in court. We didn't bring you a full Gingles argument because that's not how you make decisions as a city council. As a city council, you make decisions based on what map you like, what map you think is best for the city of Auburn. You can slice it pinwheel style, you can slice it like a pizza, you can slice it into blocks. It is your choice as the city council how you wanna slice that map as long as the districts are equally sized and it doesn't dilute the power of minorities to elect representatives of their choosing. So that is why we have not wanted to focus on Gingles because that is a court argument. And if we end up in court, yes, we'll be arguing about the Gingles preconditions. But what we're here to talk about today is what do you want out of a map? What do you think the people of Auburn should have in a map? Um, Gingles is for court and we'll go there if we need to. Um, third, I want to talk about uh, CVAP, the citizen voting age population. Um, so you might recall there was a really hot debate, um, really contentious argument politically across the country about whether the census would include a question about citizenship. And the decision was made by the courts that citizenship could not be asked as part of the census. Citizenship was not asked as part of the 2020 census. So when we talk about citizen voting age population and distinguishing between the voting age population and those who are explicitly citizens, we are guessing. The Census Bureau makes estimates. It's their best guess, but they don't pretend that they're 100% accurate about guessing who is a citizen and who isn't. CVAP does not have to be used precisely because it is an inaccurate estimate and only an estimate of the citizen voting age population. That is why we chose to go with the numbers directly from the census. The uh, 2020 census has not released, the Census Bureau has not released CVAP estimates for the 2020 census. So I don't know what they're using uh, to get those, but they're not coming directly from the Census Bureau, at least not data that I've been able to find anywhere. Um, you can Google it and see that the Census Bureau has said they have not yet released CVAP for the 2020 census. So uh, don't, be, don't be swayed by the CVAP, CVAP data that there's no such thing as a minority majority district on our map. Uh, next, I want to talk about racially polarized voting. So uh, racially polarized voting 
is determined by the totality of circumstances in a given municipality. It is not determined by a statistical analysis of four precincts and one mayoral election. As Dr. Hood rightly said, that's not an adequate sample size. With four people, you can't decide how to, you can't choose toothpaste based on results of four person survey. And you can't make any decisions based on four precincts worth of data. It's just not enough data for there ever to be a statistically significant result. So instead, the courts have said that they look at the totality of circumstances. That word is actually, that's a term that's in, in quotes used um, in multiple Supreme Court cases. The totality of circumstances includes uh, nine different uh, metrics or nine different bullet points that the courts have laid out. That includes uh, the history in a municipality of electing minorities to office. So the fact that there is not a history of electing a lot of minorities to office, the fact that minorities have not won in other districts outside of District 1 um, would be one of the things taken into consideration. Um, the uh, history of racially polarized voting in the state at large, which has been found to be uh, racially polarized, including Hispanic and Asian populations um, tending to vote in the same way that black populations do. Uh, the history of discrimination in the state or locality. Um, anything that touches the rights of minorities to register to vote, to actually vote, or to otherwise participate in the democratic process. If the municipality has a history of having some discrimination or uh, discriminatory practices in voting rights or democratic participation, that can be taken into consideration as part of the totality of circumstances. They also look at the extent to which members of minority groups in the municipality bear the effects of discrimination in education, employment, and housing. So if there's evidence, we, we would, if we were in court right now, which we are not, we're trying to avoid that court-like feeling, um, we would be talking, you know, looking at data based on the um, economic education and employment uh, discrimination that has happened in Auburn. Um, they also look at whether political campaigns have been characterized by overt or subtle racial appeals. Um, historically, um, is that something that uh, have candidates made racial appeals? So all of these things can be used. It does not have to only be precinct level data. And in a town with only four precincts, it most certainly wouldn't be based on precinct data. Um, I'm sorry, a city. Let me not call Auburn a town in the city of Auburn, it would not be based on that. So uh, since Auburn's map has never been taken to court, we don't know. We don't know what the court would say about the totality of circumstances in Auburn in 2020. We would bring forward arguments, no doubt the city would bring forward arguments as well, um, but it would be up to the court to decide the totality of circumstances. Um, it's not for us to decide here. <clears throat> Pardon me. There was also a question raised about whether our map gerrymanders. So I want to talk for a minute about what gerrymandering is. Um, the original term comes from a political cartoon. It is not a, it oh, did not originate as a technical term. Um, it originated as a, as a joke, as a, as a farcical statement. Um, and uh, it's really, it has come to mean um, any sort of, when a map is manipulated to benefit one group of people over another. <clears throat> any group of people over another. It is hard to draw a map that does not gerrymander in the sense that there are winners and losers in every map. That's always gonna be the case. So what we're concerned about is not, to, are there any winners and losers ever? Because it is a political process. There are going to be winners and losers, we get that. The kind of gerrymandering that is a problem is racial gerrymandering. The courts have said political gerrymandering, gerrymandering to benefit a particular political party, legal. Mm, technically not, I shouldn't say legal, non-justiciable. It is not something that the courts will consider. They won't even look at cases if the complaint is that it is about partisan gerrymandering. Bipartisan gerrymandering, that's when incumbents 
make a deal and say, how about we make my district more blue and we make your district more red and we both get reelected? Legal, not justiciable, not something that the courts will interfere in. All of the many ways in which we divide neighborhoods up in ways that may be fair or unfair to the people who live there, in general, that is not something that the court uh, intervenes in. Um, the court intervenes only when we're talking about racial gerrymandering. So does that mean that we have to be race blind in how we draw maps? No, it does not. The court has repeatedly said that although the ideal is that the process be race neutral, it also, the process cannot, once again, dilute the power of the minority to elect representatives of their choosing if they have adequate power to do so. And so it is your obligation to take race into consideration to the extent that you are making sure that you are not diluting the uh, voting power of minorities. So yeah, if possible, draw it without looking at racial data at all, and then check and see, is the minority population getting an adequate number of seats? If the answer is no, try again, and maybe you might have to look at the racial data to do so. Um, in, uh, we were lap talking about North Carolina being the epitome of gerrymandering, right? Um, North Carolina had districts that were shaped like long, skinny snakes in order to connect together populations that identified with one another or were racially consistent. Um, sometimes that was found to be legal. Sometimes it was found to be illegal. Um, in the case, uh, there was a case in Texas where there were two Hispanic populations in two different towns, and they were 300 miles apart. And so this, the state tried to draw a district that took this Hispanic population from this city, went all the way down a highway, and got the Hispanic population from this city, and made a Hispanic minority district. The court said, no, those people aren't connected to each other. They're 300 miles apart. You can't do that. But in plenty of other cases, uh, in the case of Chicago, for example, there is a significant Hispanic, majority, Hispanic population on the north side of town and another Hispanic population on the west side of town. They are connected similarly along a highway, and the courts ruled that that was appropriate. They're not that far away from each other, and it allowed them to have the min minority representation that they deserve to have. So it is not that shapes can never be changed. It is not that race cannot be taken into consideration. It's just that it needs to not be wild and crazy. If you look at our maps side by side, the city's proposed map and our proposed map, they are not wildly different. Our map is not wild and crazy. It's reasonable. There are no arms sticking out in strange directions. There are no ridiculous uh, loops. It's just a different map in which the districts have the same population and in which minorities have the opportunity, not even the guarantee, but the opportunity to have one more person of their community's choosing on this city council. That's all we're asking for, is a second district in which there's the possibility that a minority could be elected. It'll be a diverse, really cool, interesting district. And I have no idea who will win. But it might be a minority. And at least the minority population would have significant influence over whoever represents them in that district. So that's what we're asking for. We're asking not to go to court. We're asking for you to make a choice because it's an option, a legal option in front of you that you can consider. Not because you're being forced by the force of law, not because we have to go to court, but just because it's the right thing to do. I hope you'll consider this map. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Who will be next? Who will be next for the... Good evening. My name is Tara Foster, and I'm the Executive Director for the Alabama NAACP. 
Give us your address, please, ma'am. I'm sorry. Give us your address. Huntsville, Alabama. I'm sorry, what? We need the full address full either address, of the please. business or your residence, please, for the record. 809 Highway 72 West, Athens, Alabama, 35612. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. You're welcome. I'm here on behalf of the state conference and our local NAACP, NAACP branch 5038. And I would like to point out that the state NAACP is paying attention to how cities are drawing their maps. Um, we want fairness. That's why we're here. I think it's important. Um, and this meeting has been interesting to me. Um, I can't help but to think that um, our map, the NAACP map, is being discredited. And I find that troubling. Um, Auburn has an opportunity to be a leader uh, in the state with how their map is drawn. So I ask that your vote is taken seriously when you return. Because we are watching, we are interesting, interested, and um, we don't want to go to court. We just ask for fairness across the board for all citizens to be fairly represented. Thank you. Thank you. Who will be next? Uh, Elizabeth Hill, 274 Bragg Avenue, Auburn. Um, I'd like to address uh, a process question and a collaborative question. So I think most of you have seen the email that we sent you about the city of Huntsville, one of our cities in Alabama. Uh, a similar city that's doing similar things that we are. They're redrawing their maps. They have the same time, mun their municipal elections are the same time we are. They took a very different approach to their redistricting process. They actually set up a website that had all of the criteria on it. They put software on the website to invite citizens to draw their own maps and submit them. They gave them a deadline, the deadline was in a right amount of time so they could review all of the citizens' data and allow the process to be collaborative from the beginning. So we, as the NAACP, back in August, began asking questions of how the city would do their map. Could we be a part of the process? That's all we asked. Could we be a part of the process? And they said, no, we're gonna draw a map. And we said, okay, we understand that. At what point can we be a part of the process? You can be a part of the process once we have these citizen open forums. So in November, when the map came out, we saw the map. We said, mm, we're seeing a different picture on this map. We'll go to the citizen forums. We went to the citizen forums. We asked questions. We were realized then quickly that we were going to have to probably do a little more work. So we came to you all with a proof of concept map. We said, look, this is the way we're looking at the data. Can we sit down? Can we collaborate? Can we collaborate? We kept asking this question. The city staff did meet with us, and the answer in the, in the meeting was, we have drawn our map. We, we have drawn our map. That was the answer that we were given. We had, so when we went back to do our alternative map that is proposed in front of you, and if you would like, I have a handout that has the two maps side by side, since Tabitha was talking about that. Since we did not get the opportunity to have direct collaboration with the city, we took a collaborative approach. So we originally gave you a proof of concept map that said, hey, we think this is possible to do too. Can we figure this out? And so when we went back to do our revisions, we looked very closely at what the city did. Look, the city did a lot of hard work. They did, they put in hours. Like we've heard this over and over and we are grateful that they did that. They made some very significant shifts in some of the ways that these districts looked. They had, they met, they were working with the federal criteria, they were working with other criteria, but they were also working with some things that they knew from our city that they were trying to do. Looking at urban and suburban districts, looking at different things. So when we went and drew our map for the alternative map, 
we tried to take all of that into consideration. We tried to take in a collaborative approach. We said, we have a proof of concept map, we have a city map. If we take both of those, we landed an alternative map. Maybe it's a great map. Maybe it could be tweaked even further, but we're trying to get into a collaborative conversation of how this can go. So we did the best that we could to say, here's our map, here's the city map, we're gonna give you the next iteration. We're not throwing their map out, we're not saying that their map is terrible, we're not starting over. I remember looking at the data back in the fall going, I don't know how the city's gonna move this around. That Ward 2 is crazy, like what are they gonna do? And they made some great decisions and we tried to follow that. And when you look at the map side by side, they have very similar characteristics. But we're adding that data on top to say, hey, can you give the minorities an opportunity here to get a second person on the council, to get representation that they may not be getting right now, in addition to the hard work that the city did. So we just want to say to you that we took the most collaborative approach that we were allowed in this process. We wish that there could have been a more collaborative process. I hope maybe the next time around when we get to census stuff that there will be opportunities to have a more collaborative process. But that's how we came at this. And so we wanted to acknowledge um, our process in doing that. Thank you. Who will be next? Good afternoon. Letitia Kelly Smith, 2262 Heritage Ridge Lane in Auburn, Alabama, 36830. So as I have shared with many of you, I am an engineer. And one of the key traits of a good engineer is being intuitive and being able to predict what is going to happen. Unfortunately, I did predict what was going to happen tonight, and that was that we were going to come in here and the lawyers were going to tell us that the map was illegal and that there would be a lot of data analysis. And I'm not a lawyer, no one back in this room that's part of the NAACP is a lawyer, so therefore we would not have an opportunity to give any banter back and forth. Because as smart as I might think I am, and as good as I might be able to come up here to the mic and talk, you are not going to hear me. You're not going to give me the benefit of the doubt if the lawyer tells you that the NAACP map is illegal. So let me tell you what I observed, and then I'm going to tell you what I heard. Actually, I'm going to tell you what I heard first. So one of the things that I heard Mr. Walker say was that even with the substantial increase in the minority population, it is not enough to warrant a second minority majority district. What I would like to ask you to consider is what is enough if the Auburn city of Auburn can have a nearly 37% increase a minority population, a significant increase in the Hispanic community, the Asian community, and the black community. What is it going to take? I think he even went on to say, maybe at the next census. So you guys are telling me that that's acceptable to you? That we can just ignore the fact that we have a 37% minority population and that we can just so lackadaisically say, we could just wait another 10 years and see what we get. Right? We always like to spout about the fact that Auburn is such a great community to live in. I think the mayor may have said this in the past, that it's a good thing that black folks in particular could live all over the city to such a point that we can feel comfortable in living in any neighborhood we want to live in. So therefore, we don't live in the same location, so therefore we do not constitute a minority population. When are you guys are going to apply the litmus test? Mr. Trey Hood is a nice data, anal a data analyzer from the University of Georgia. I can tell you I'm from Georgia Tech, so I'm just going to leave that where that is. <laughs> but the thing about data, data is nothing until you take that data and you turn it 
into some useful information. And what you guys did today was probably spend about an hour and maybe 15 minutes behind closed doors hearing a bunch of data, a bunch of lawyer talk, right? And then you came out here and they repeated it for about 40 minutes, 30 minutes to us. But my question is, how much of it do you understand? How much of it do you think is fair? When are you going to hold the lawyers and the city manager accountable so that you can then actually make a good decision yourself, so that you can take that data, ask some questions, and demand that someone tells you why our map is legal? What was, hap what was presented today was, here is all the bad things that is wrong with the NAACP map. What I did not see was a comparative analysis that said, here is what the NAACP map said, here is what I said. Instead, I support the, the, the map that the city proposed. Of course you do, because you were the person that gave input into it. So how are you going to be the reviewer and the approver of the data that you created and not support it? Why would you pay him <laughs> if he's going to discredit his own data? So I'm just trying to have a conversation and I want you guys to look into your hearts and to try to be fair about this. We tried to collaborate in a collaborative spirit because we could never come to the table, as Ms. Elizabeth Hill just said, and really say, here is our map. Let's talk about your map. Let's work together. Instead, we provided a proof of concept. We sent that to you guys, yes. The city spent a lot of hours, and you guys keep talking about how many hours the city spent. That is what they are paid to do. They are supposed to do that. That is their job. We don't get cookies for doing what it is that we're supposed to do. The people who have also spent hundreds of hours looking at this map are people like me that's not paid to do that, that learn how to do this because it was important. So I just want to just let you know that that's nothing to be praising them about. That's what they're supposed to do. That's why they're here. And I want you guys to understand that they work for you. They are giving you this data so that you can understand it, so that you can ask questions. And one of the things that I share with some of you is that you have to then be the one to raise your hand and demand that certain things happen. Because the city manager has already said here in the public forum that there is nothing that tells her to do more than what she has already done. She gave us one map. And because there's nothing written that says that they have to listen to anybody else, she's, de she's done what she's supposed to do. And so what Ms. Hill just tried to share with you is that we had a proof of concept. We sat down with the city and her team, with the city manager and her team. And we talked about the fact that what else do you need in this map to make this map more palatable? And they shared some stuff with us. And that's how come we gave you guys that map at 3 o'clock that everybody wanted to talk about. Because we spent some hours trying to take our map and update it and give you a map that you might feel was good enough. So we look at the city's map as version 1. We look at the NAACP map as simply version 2 of the city map. That's what we tried to do, was give you something that made sure that each of you stayed in your wars and wouldn't have to run against each other. The map isn't perfect, but I would argue that probably the city map is, if map is not perfect either. So if we can't strive for perfection, why don't we strive for something close? Why don't we strive for something that's fair and equitable? Why don't we strive for something that all the people behind me are here asking you to consider? At some point, we have to, as one of the citizens has said to you often, look in your heart, be open, and listen. And that is all that we are asking you to do. Thank you. Who will be next? Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Lee. I live at 1652 St. Andrews Lane, Auburn, Alabama, 368. 
3-0. And I'm a member of the redistricting committee for the NAACP. And my, my request and my comments will be short. I don't need to reiterate what Elizabeth, Letitia, and Tabitha have said. What I want to uh, challenge you to do, and I appreciate the motion that was made for the postponement of the vote till next week, but I would like to challenge you to realize that in my opinion, you as city council members may pass a motion, you may put a motion on the floor and pass a motion that says, we as city council direct the city staff, city manager and staff, to meet with the NAACP and make best efforts to collaborate and merge these two maps. And I'm not talking about a whole lot of change. Uh, Mr. Walker talked about and the other uh, city attorney talked about if you can move 10 people here and there. I think it may require moving a few more people than that. But some of you as city council members have expressed to me that you like the NAACP map, but it falls short in some cases. And I think we can accommodate if given the opportunity to make those changes, to make less, maybe less drastic changes from the city map to the NAACP map, but make changes that will meet the needs of those of you who've given me critical information about critiques about the NAACP map. And if we can do that between now and next week, I would challenge you to pass that motion tonight even though the city manager has done a great job, as we've all talked about, and she's not required to meet with us, but you, you can require her to. And you can require her and her staff to be collaborative. And if we can't reach an agreement, maybe we can come up with something better than either one of the maps without a whole lot of changes. But give us the opportunity. We, as NAACP members, and committee are reasonable people and we care about the work the city has done. We're not here to destroy it. We're not here to cause trouble. We're here to create something fair. And if you, you, if you realize as city council members, the staff works for you. You do not work for the staff. So therefore, a motion is perfectly in order for you to make the motion and pass it, and we will be available any time, any day that the city is available to work together. I think we can have something that everybody's proud of. Thank you. Who will be next? Mr. Dawson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, mayor and the mayor pro tem in their absence, Herbert Walter Demar Jr., 412 Opelika Road, apartment 111. I would like to say in a, a brief a bit of levity, I am a graduate of the University of Georgia too, along with Dr. <laughs> Hood. Go dogs. <laughs> But the if you know anything about Athens, Georgia, you know that they have a commission, athens Clark County Commission. Guess how many minorities are in that commission? Three. They have three minorities on that commission right now as we speak. So in terms of college towns in the SEC, I hate to say athens Georgia is ahead of us. This is why groups like the NAACP and groups like the League of Women Voters and even citizens like yours truly are very concerned about the way the maps are going to turn out. I agree with the NAACP that it is not illegal despite what your city council, your city legal people have told you. Um, at University of Georgia, I got a degree in history. 
And for my senior thesis paper, I had to work on something dealing with black legislators during the Reconstruction period, how they got there and how they were removed. To make a long story short, it took a lot of violence, a lot of legal stuff that they, that they implemented Jim Crow to prevent African Americans from even having any representation in the Georgia legislature. And um, it was 60 years ago this year that Barry Francis Early became the first African American to graduate from the University of Georgia. Um, at the time, there were no African Americans in government in Athens, Georgia at that time. Now today, they have three people on that commission. They've even had a police, a couple of police chiefs and sheriff's deputies, sheriff's people who are African American. So if it could be done in the enemy town of Athens, Georgia, <laughs> then it can be done here in Auburn, Alabama. And why so? Why is this concern? So that we can raise certain issues like the issues that they are dealing with right now concerning a black cemetery there underneath one of the buildings at the Georgia campus, a certain African-American community within the university that was sort of leveled so that some of the dorms can be built there. And even the present black neighborhoods of Athens, some of which um, have been designated historic districts by the National Park Service and by the city of Athens and by the state of Georgia. And decisions like that are based on who is on those councils and those commissions. Not just the elected ones, but also the appointed ones. This is important because to make decisions like what are we going to have a cultural center, first of all, where we're going to have a library, what's going to be in the library, where are you going to move the recycling center, what are you going to do at the airport, the airport situation that's up, or even the Hamilton Place, or even something like short-term rentals. People need people that will represent them in matters like this. And even the concerns that Mr. Griswold raised on the consent agenda tonight, someone must have approached him, one of his constituents must have approached him about this problem. And even in your case, Mr. Dixon, concerning it, and you and everyone here, and of course you, Mr. Dawson, concerning public safety matters. Someone had, to, in the situation involving Cox Road, someone, one of your constituents had to tell you about the situation or else you wouldn't have raised it up. This is why we're raising this issue. And all, we're, all I'm asking for as a citizen is just for y'all to be fair. Now, I live in a neighborhood right now in an apartment community which is not predominantly one color or one class. There are a number of international people there. Yes, there are a number of blacks and a couple of whites. You know, this is just the real world. You don't necessarily need statistical data, really, even though if you want to consider it, fine. But just look around you in the city of Auburn. Just look at your constituents. Just look at how they changed. And yeah, the you know the situation involving the students. You know, it, that just goes with being a college town. But still, in order to make the students feel welcome at a place like Auburn, you have to consider them too because they do have an influence and so on and so forth. So I would ask you, just as a citizen and also as a person who holds not only a history degree but a public policy degree, a Ph.D. from Auburn, so I know a little that I we had to study stuff like what you all are proposing. And we also know that it's a mess. So for someone to say that one map is illegal just because it's not their map is you know, I don't think that's very accurate to say. 
I did, uh, at the last time I spoke, I did uh, mention something like the Voting Rights Act. And from what I've noticed in the presentation tonight in the committee of the whole, they did consider the federal, some federal action, the Gingles case. But I would still hope that you would take the Voting Rights Act as it stands now with or without the proposed changes being made in Washington right now, which they may or may not vote on, or if they voted on it, they might vote it up or they might vote it down. But take those into consideration. I would hope that you would do. Don't, you know, you, you have to think about the past of Auburn and how we got to where we are now. And you have to think about the present and you most certainly have to think about the future. Because if things continue as they are, you're going to have to, with, with or without looking at census data. And with that, I will finish. And again, I say, go dogs. And I also know we're going to lose tomorrow night to Auburn men's basketball team. Thank you. Who will be next? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Joanna Abram, 206 Timberdale Court, Auburn, Alabama, Ward 2. I wasn't going to say anything tonight. I just wanted to come and listen. But I have to say what grieves my spirit. I'm the president of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We've been here. We have been here in this area since 1978. What grieves my spirit is this. I have been coming here for several meetings and just listening. That's the only thing I've been doing is listening. And what grieves my spirit is that I'm a very peaceful person and I really try to have a meeting of the minds with individuals and to hear their heart and to see. Not saying this coming from the council, but what I have heard from individuals who have spoken, not from you, let me say that. I want to clarify that, make sure everyone understands that. But what grieves my spirit is this. This has turned into a us versus them or them versus us or two maps against one another. And instead of really trying to hear, understand, and hear the hearts of individuals and to work together. I have been here, as I said before, I date myself. I went to elementary school here. Uh, and I've also said they're military family. And so I've said all that prior before. But I do look for people to work together, not be at odds with one another. So if you listen to the previous meetings, the previous recordings, it's been filled with a lot of us, them, this, that. It's been filled with a lot of that. The only thing I wanted to hear is people working together. And I have not been able to hear that. To be honest with you, I have not. Um, and it hard, it, it, it's, it's very sad to say that I have not heard that. When we moved back here and I re we raised our kids here, um, my neighbors and I get along wonderful. I mean, we really do. Um, and I say this because I have a neighbor who is 78 years old, Caucasian, and she's my sister. Even when her mother passed away at 103 years old, she said, do you guys not understand that they, they have more in common than what they have that separates them? And we really do. If I would have brought her here tonight, she would have came forward with me. And so I say that to say that when we try to work together, we can do just that. But it saddens my heart because that has not been what I have seen in coming to these meetings and talking about the maps. So I had to say that. I was not going to say anything. But I had to say that because that has not been the case. That has not been the case. And I had to say it and just bring that to everyone's attention and be able to acknowledge that's not what's been happening here. And it's, if you just really, and I say you, but it's not really you, it's everyone who's standing behind me, really who's sitting behind me as well. If they're honest with themselves, they would know that has not been the case. So 
I just had to make that plain. Uh, whichever way the vote goes, I just think we could have gone about this in a better manner. And I would have expected that more from Auburn, to be honest with you. And no, I did not attend an a SEC school. I attended two HBCU schools. So I say that to say that, understand that I'm just a peaceful person and I'm always looking for peace and for people to work together. It's not as hard and it's not as complicated, but it's said to me that this has not been the case. Thank you. Who will be next? My name is Joe Davis. I'm at 311 Lancaster Avenue. And I'm in support of the NAACP's efforts to create at least two minority-majority districts for our city uh, in order to create a more fair representation of Auburn's growing and diversifying population. And if it's okay with Mr. Dawson, uh, for the remainder of my time here, I'd like to actually just offer a prayer over this process. Would that be all right? Let us pray. Oh, God, we come before you now with gratitude in our hearts. God, we thank you for being a God of love who is with us now in this very room. You never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for making each of us in this room, every citizen of this city, in your own image, with dignity and worth. Lord, every person in this city, with dignity and infinite worth. We thank you for the calling you've given every one of us to be good stewards of your creation and to love our neighbors as ourselves. God, I thank you tonight for these, your servants, our mayor, our city manager, our city staff, our city council members. I give thanks for the way of service they have chosen to take up on behalf of all of us here. Lord, we all come to this room tonight as complex people carrying burdens, Lord, carrying joy and hope, trusting that you alone can hold us together, God, in your love and peace. God, help us to trust you more, more than our fears and more than our wounds, and even more than our accomplishments. May we Lean on your everlasting arms tonight. God, we remember that in your word you make clear expectations for those who sit in places of authority. In Psalm 72, we hear the prayer that for the king to endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. For the king will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. Through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 22, you remind us that your blessing came on kings who defended the rights of the poor and needy because isn't that what it means to know me, declares the Lord. We remember the apostle Paul writing to the Christians in Rome and his teaching that those in authority are first and foremost your servants that honoring you and doing your will is their highest purpose, that any portion of power they enjoy is given by you and can be taken away. And so we pray, I pray, God, that you would be glorified through the decisions of the city council. I pray that we would have the eyes to see how our lives are all connected and how our common good is upheld when we listen and respond to those most vulnerable among us. We pray that your kingdom would come in Auburn as it is in heaven through your power working in each of these, your servants, God, may your truth be revealed. May your light shine brighter. May the voices of those most silenced be heard and loud and clear. Lord, defend their cause through this governing body tonight. Lord, we pray for wisdom, for strength, for courage to do what is right and good for all citizens. May we put the interests of others above our own. May we act with love for the common good. May we be good neighbors, recognizing your image in every person here. And we thank you again for this council, our mayor, our city staff, our first responders. We especially remember our hospital staff and all those who are working to make this place we call home such a wonderful city. In the name of Jesus, whose perfect love sets us free from all our fears. Amen. Thank you. All right, who will be next? <clears throat> Anyone else want to speak? John Sophocles, 530 Lee Road, 115, Opelika, Alabama, 36804. 
Uh, I'm going to try and be brief. Seems to be a lot of discussion about growth in Auburn. So I'm here speaking in support of the letter and more the spirit of what the NAACP is trying to accomplish here. If I get the data wrong, forgive me, but I understand that the census data says we have grown 43%. So why hasn't this body grown? I think that three increased members on this body would be a huge improvement. There's a lot of discussion about diversity. Out of all of you, the one that I know and speak to the most is Connie Fitch Taylor, who I think the world of. Not because of her gender or her color, but the content of her character and her spirit. There's nothing that I can say I think that will change your minds, and I think that most of you hate casual empiricism as much as I. But I look at this body, and I do not see diversity. How about we have some more members on this so that real representation will remain constant or something close to constant and we might see some more diverse faces, views, concepts, perspectives brought before you. This is nothing new under the sun. In 1929, our U.S. Congress limited itself to 435. What's happened to population, my dear counsel, since 1929? It has grown immensely. We have one House member for something like 700,000 in Alabama. Auburn can be better than this. Make real representation to where there's enough members here that can hear what the people want. Come to you and say these are the problems. If not, I can only forecast that folks will think as well of you as they do of the approval rating of our Congress which can't possibly be representative under those circumstances. I appreciate your time to hear me speak. Some folks say I'm too passionate, so forgive me if indeed I am. Does anyone else want to speak to this matter? Anybody else? Good evening, um, Leah Billy Welburn, 112 North of Bartleben Street, Apartment 5, Auburn. I'd like to add my voice to the request made earlier this evening. <coughs> Excuse me. As a council, please will you pass a resolution tonight directing the city staff to work in collaboration with the NAACP representatives beginning this week to create a map that works for everyone. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone else? All right. We'll close the public hearing. No one else speaking. Uh, discussion? You have motion and second to postpone, so from here, yeah, discussion is up to you. Well, I'd certainly like to uh, respond to um, as many of you as I can. There was a lot to listen to, and I appreciate all of your uh, contributions to the conversation um, a couple of a couple of things immediately to me um, I must say the idea that uh, we look into our hearts is certainly uh, front and center for me and I think there's many of you here tonight who have seen me and other members of this body at um, meetings that you've presented your argument and you presented your case, and I've listened, and I've looked into my heart. I know for a fact that, well, I, I can say that I, I have come to know some of the staff uh, directly working on the, the redistricting process, and I, I believe I know their hearts and I believe that I have <clears throat> assessed them to be good people with, uh, with a large picture in their mind. I 
I think um, I think we've. I'm glad we've had this conversation. I'd like, I'd, like to I'd like for you to all acknowledge that we haven't rushed to a vote on this. Every time it has come before us, one of us has voted to postpone, and we have done so over, over the course of since November, early November. So I, I, think, I think there is evidence to support the idea that, that this body is certainly open to uh, a second min minority majority. I'm certainly open to it. I, I, I've made no secret of that. Uh, I've, I've gone to every meeting that I can to show that I am sympathetic to the idea of a diverse council. I, I agree. We look incredibly uh, homogenous up here, and I think there is a it do, the look of us does not necessarily reflect the population of our town, but that there is a, a number of there is a number of degrees of there there is a there is more wrinkles to it than simply the lines in our town. There must be people to run. There must be compelling reasons to run. There must be a a great argument that you present. There must uh, and. This, I do believe that this is open to anyone, regardless of where you live in this town. I think we've complicated our conversation through the uh, correspondence of legal representation that makes conversations between the city and other bodies much more difficult now because people have drawn lines in the sand legal lines that make collaboration incredibly difficult. I don't even know that it is possible legally for us to collaborate. I, I don't know that because I live on Woodfield Drive and I'm a fire inspector. I have to, I have to look at people. I have to get, be in front of all the people that are, give, that are contributing to this conversation and divine away, while I look into my heart, ab about fairness for everybody. And I believe my representation on council ha has focused on that since uh, being elected in 2018. So I don't even know. I, I'd be willing to extend that hand of collaboration from my perspective, but I don't know what the ramifications are if I say, hey, who has an appetite here on this council to direct the city manager to work collaboratively with, with the NAACP? Is that even possible at this point? I don't know. Well, I don't, you can say yes, but I don't know that it's, I don't know that legally we have that that opportunity, given the intervention of legal uh, legal commentary, so I, I don't know that I can pursue it any further than that. Other than to say, I have looked into my heart. Any any other discussion? Oh well, I would like to say um, I I just got some comments that I would would like to make about tonight's um, <clears throat> public hearing. Uh, I, I listened to everyone that spoke tonight, and I, I also heard valid points from both sides, even with the a committee of the whole and, um, and, and the NAACP in the public hearing. So it... it when, when, when you're sitting in a position that, and I'm going to just talk about me. I can't speak for nobody else. When you sit in a, in, in a position up here like I'm sitting in, being the only minority on this council, your mind sort of make you think um, is, I mean, who is who, who is actually being, and I don't know no, no way to put this, but you know, is 
everybody telling the truth about the legal, the legality of, of the maps. Uh, <clears throat> Is the NAACP map legal? And of course, we've heard tonight that it's not. Um, but we also heard that the city of Auburn map is legal. I just want, you know, in my mind, I'm trying to think why would the NAACP present to the council, the city manager, a illegal map? What I mean, what would they, what would they gain from it? So it puts you in a situation that maybe questions some things in your heart, in your mind. I just, I don't see a reason. Maybe it wasn't done. I, I would have liked to say that maybe it wasn't done. Maybe to, um, make this, that the city expected, or the expectations of the city or something. But to just to say it's illegal, and I know we heard from legal counsel and that type of thing, but I'm just trying to figure out what would they gain from it. I, um, <clears throat> and, you know, at this point, I don't know actually how much, as a council person, that we can actually speak on some of the things I probably want to say. Um, because we, you know, we got legal advice in our session. So it makes it sort of hard to ask certain questions, but I understand I can, after, you know, in private. Um, but, the, but, but alternatives to any situation It's not bad. Um, that's even including when we raising our children in our marriages or even in our workplace. So there should be an alternative to any situation put before you. There should not actually ever have to be that this is it. We're living on a different world. We're living on a different time. We're not living on a general where, uh, uh, in a time where somebody sits something on the table and we got to eat it just because they sit it there. So I, as a council person, I would like to propose that we ask this council, this, the, the, not the council, but the city staff to maybe um, reach a decision no, that's not what I want to say. Oh, what I, I really want to say, and, I, and I, I, uh, my man going so many different directions right now, is that the proposal that Mr. Sophilis uh, proposed that we sit, or that the city staff um, at least try to come back around the table and not, not, just destroy our map, but at least look at some things that may, some tweaks in the maps and 
put them together. And at the end of the day, that that maps not only um, satisfy the council, but it satisfy the people. Tony, was that a motion? Oh, hold on, wait, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. We we got a motion and a, a second on the table. Am I right? You've you've already voted to postpone. This matter is no longer on the table. So, but uh, I want to I want to be clear, Councilperson Dawson. Um, anytime, a the council cannot direct the city staff itself to do anything. Exactly. It can only direct the city manager. Um, B, I would never ask you to take a formal vote about this, uh, other than if you're dealing with my contract itself. This time, I mean, if a majority of you are asking us to take a different look, um, we've, we've informed you we've taken multiple looks. We're happy to look again. I need specifics as to what it is that you want us to look at. And no, I don't expect you to have the technical information. I'll have to vet who we can meet with based on things you heard tonight and letters we've received. If we can meet and collaborate, as Councilperson Parsons alluded to, we'll have to vet that with legal counsel. And I cannot answer that question tonight unless Legal counsel is ready to answer it, Rick. Well, uh, let me just say this: okay. we, we've had to, we've had to meet tonight, and we've postponed it to the twenty fifth. So mm -hmm. we were just giving people a chance to have some input. That's what the public hearing had to say. So it's, really, this matter is closed at this point. We'll, we'll be back on the twenty fifth. The actual we'll redistricting plan, yes. But any of you, you know, um, it I've received as we've talked before one. One council member proposed in the middle of no November a change they'd like us to look at. If people have got any specifics, any of you, that they want the staff to relook at or figure out, you know, I'm certainly happy to do that. But to date, from the council members themselves, I've had no other feedback about that. Um, and so until <clears throat> Councilperson Taylor said something this evening, but our ability, um, there's been much said about collaborating with groups when the map was first drawn. Um, the way that was done, as the city attorney indicated, we put out, I put out an email, the NAACP received the same email in July explaining what the process was. I had one council member ask a question about that. That was Councilperson Taylor, and that was it. Then we moved into November. So um, we don't collaborate with any one group when we're putting the city's official map together. That is a proposed map based on data and the law, and that's it. Not opinions, nothing else. So that, that map is out there. We have to, by law, and I've said this repeatedly, and maybe I understand people are tired of hearing it, but the staff has no goal other than to advise the city council based <coughs> on what we see in the data and our professional best efforts with the data to put something together that didn't just meet some of the criteria. We tried to meet all the criteria. We tried to do absolutely everything we could do, every criteria out there that is known with redistricting. Um, nobody said a map was perfect. What we did is we put something forward for you to consider, um, and we are here. If some of you are asking me to do something specific, I'm happy to sit down and talk with you about it. I just need to understand clearly what it is you want, and we'll make every attempt to get feedback to you. Um, to date, uh, we have had no other special interest groups ask for interaction with staff about this. We've had some dialogue, but it, it is certainly up to you. And I, I don't <coughs> need a motion um, from you. It's not, nobody's asked to date to do something different. And so I'm, I'm happy to try to oblige as long as we can track legally in doing so. I think the only thing to do at this point is meet the 25th and uh, vote on this proposal before us right now. If, it, if it's <coughs> passed, then it's passed. If it's defeated, then we start over again. We're trying to come up with some type of uh, agreement. I think it's the best thing to do at this point. Okay, so with that being said, I'm, I'm just going to ask this question. Okay, we, we have a meeting, a special call meeting that we voted on for the 25th. So in between time, is that what you're saying that we can come to you if if we want yeah, any any okay. of you at the council? I need I just need an idea of what it is you're looking for. If you've had conversations or you're interested in something specific, give me a call, text me, you know, whatever. I'll make all the time I can make to talk with the council members about what it is you're wanting to get at. Now, for the public, I don't meet with 
more than a couple council members at a time. We don't, we don't do that. There would not be a body assembled. But any of you, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk with you about it, figure out what you're trying to get at, and, and research what we can between now and the 25th to provide you feedback. That's not a problem at all. Happy to do it. Okay. Now, um, at the last city council meeting, we was, I think, t told that we could um, ask questions or, uh, and, and the answers would be to us before this city council meet, meeting. And we could put those, we could, um, I guess we was going to have some type of um, feedback or whatever. So I, the questions that were asked, we didn't, I, I did well, we didn't know uh, the answer to them until an hour before the meeting. So it's sort of it's sort of hard to to wait an hour before me to get the answers to your questions. The answers to your questions from two weeks ago is that am I understanding you? Correctly? Yeah, but I, I I thought we was gonna set up some type of you know well where we could at least uh, ask some questions. I can't remember exactly the wording that was put out before us, but but if there was questions or anything that we needed to ask, and those questions would be submitted and we would have answers prior to the meeting, but not an hour prior to the meeting is not what was said. Um, and, 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 and you answered questions tonight. That's when we had this special meeting. That's and I'm trying to recall, um, I, I, I'm happy to go back and re look through my notes and minutes. I don't recall specifically what you're referring to. Now we did give you questions and answers and I actually have an update for you. We'll be emailing that have come through the city's redistricting site. We've received a few more questions and we've provided those to you all along so that you know what the citizens are asking or if they've called, emailed, et cetera. Um, that, that's the one question and answer we've referred to. If there's another thing, I'll go back and check and, and make sure we're tracking. Um, as we discussed the last meeting, you would be the first to know you're the elected body and the decision makers on this. Um, we haven't been withholding information. We had to present it to you all at once. And this was the only way in which we could do that. There is no memo generated, and this team needed to speak to um, the, the alternative map provided to give you that, that information um, from there. Obviously, in the city's map provided, it was provided for specific reasons, which we have provided to you since early November. That's why we haven't spoken to it further. But if you have specific questions to that, we'll be happy to speak to that as well. Well, tonight, was, <clears throat> tonight, an hour before the meeting is when, when, when we found out that the NAACP map was illegal. Illegal? That's, yeah. Basically, if that's what you said, that the map was illegal. Well, tonight, was the meeting was to get input from the city attorney and, and whoever, whatever attorney he has selected. And I think that's not, I don't see how we could have known any earlier than that. When we get, we get everybody together and ask the questions of him, and, and we get their professional opinion. And, and I appreciate your comment, but what were you thinking about that? Two points. One, the information that was shared tonight wasn't finalized until yesterday. The second point is, when I get a, lawyer, a letter from another lawyer or another group threatening a lawsuit, it's going to be my advice to get all of our information and meet with legal counsel first, and you hear it first before you share it with anybody else. I think that's prudent legal advice. I, I will continue to give that legal advice, and as long as we're under a threat of being sued by anybody that walks to this podium or sends a letter, that will probably be the protocol because I think it serves the best interest of this body who has to act as a body. And everybody on this group deserves to hear that in information when we're under a threat of litigation before anybody else hears it. And unfortunately, that's the... That's the tone and tenor that this has been given to us, and it's not uh, by our choosing. It was what was, was dictated to us. So um, we're pleased to give you the information. It just has to go in a certain manner now. Okay, and, and, and I appreciate that information because I think that's what I wanted it to be uh, known, that, you know, uh, that we was threatened, that the NAACP sent a, a threat uh, to be sued. So that never did come out tonight, so I, I, I was – Hoping that I sort of kind of brought that up for that to be said because I didn't know if I needed to, could say it or not. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just for clarity. That was my point. Okay. Just for clarity and so that uh, each council member, particularly myself, stays in our lane. Mm -hmm. um, so if I understood you correctly, uh, I could call you and say, hey, I met with somebody 
who would really like to sit down again with you. It, but that seems to me to be me directing you to do something and therefore me getting out of my lane and not being representative of the body. Well, my questions would come as follows. There's been some confusion about the city's lack of attendance at some ward meetings. We haven't been able to because of some items that were just discussed without our legal counsel present. Um, and it's unfortunate that that is where we are, but that's where we are. At the end of the day, I can meet with individual citizens, but I do have to vet, you know, what's going on with legal counsel because we have been put down this path. It's not the ideal situation. It is the cards in which have fallen where they have in this in this process. Um, we try to meet with individual citizens and we've tried to my knowledge to respond as best that we can to everyone. One of the challenges is the, the process and, and I acknowledge a lot of people said this, it's a confusing process for citizens. We only do it once every 10 years. Um, state law says a, a few things about it and federal law says much as you've heard tonight at nauseum about it. Um, and also this is a nonpartisan Council, so we're not talking about anything having to do with partisan. We're talking about local council districts where I believe the most impact is. Um, at the end of the day, I'm happy to try to meet with anybody if I'm able to that, that once there are questions answered as to you know where we stand with the city's map, you've got a proposed map in front of you as we've discussed before. Any council member can move to amend it in any fashion in which they see fit, the sooner you tell me about that, the more we can analyze um, and, and provide feedback if we're able to do that against legal measures or if you want a replacement map, that's fine. Anybody at this dais can propose it. We're happy to do that. We just need the information as quickly as possible for stuff you might want us to consider as council members or citizens are asking you um, and you want to consider it to get to the staff so we can provide information to you to make a decision. That's Thank all. You. Ready to move on to resolutions? Oh, look, one more question here. Yes, sir. Uh, again, in, in um, following up on Bob's, make sure we're mm -hmm. in our lane. The, our ability to be collaborative at this point is very limited because the situation we've been put in, which is potential lawsuit. So because of that, the potential and if I say something I shouldn't say, you should cut me off here. Uh, we, we simply can't discuss things that have the potential for litigation. So our opportunities for collaboration at this point are very, very limited. Right? Okay? They are. I'll have the city attorney speak to that. I think you've summarized that. Okay. The, what information you have should be presented in a public meeting. It should be presented to all of you at the same time. And we all get to hear it and see it and make decisions okay. based upon that. But when someone has, when, when a group or individuals have threatened lawsuits from the, from the podium and have sit, put that in writing, mm -hmm. it makes it difficult for me to suggest that any single, single council member meet with a group or with a specific group who has threatened litigation unless you have legal counsel there. Um, it makes it difficult. And we, it, it, it's hampered mm -hmm. the process. Again, not, not at anybody's choosing, but... It's just the situation we find ourselves in. Thank you. That clarifies it. Thank yes, you. sir. That also does not stop any council member from meeting with with me, the city manager, and I can bring some staff with me or if we need to um, analyze something you want to submit. And any citizen emails anything, and we're going to take a hard look at it. <laughs> Ready to move on to resolutions? Ms. Crouch. Item 10A is a request from NP Alabama Investments, LLC, for vacation of a drainage and utility easement located at 114 East Veterans Boulevard. A public hearing is required. Move to approve. Second. All right. Open the public hearing on this matter. Anybody want to speak to this matter? Seeing none, we'll, uh, all in favor? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion for uh, Temporary Mayor Dawson. Yes. Those are all the items of business we have for you this evening. All right. Uh, before we move on to uh, open citizens open forum, I, I would like to make it clear as a member of this council, I support Ms. Crouch 100%. She's worked her rear end off to get this to the table. We heard from experts tonight that said it was a, a good job of what had been done. So I appreciate you and your staff and 
I know what it's like to be take a lot of heat sometimes for stuff. I was up working city government for a long time. And uh, I, I just appreciate your hard work. I've known you for over 20 years, and you've cared about this city. And you're one of the most fair people I've ever been around. So thank you for your hard work, and keep up the good work. All right, any, it, now it's time for citizens to speak to us on any matter they want to for three minutes. Anything at all? Yes, ma'am. I'm Linda Lee, uh, 1652 St. Andrews Lane in Auburn, 36830. Um, I just wanted to comment <laughs> that um, I was reading an article today, and I, I'm not sure exactly where it was. I was Googling redistricting and trying to see what some of the other towns in Alabama were doing with this. and. It was interesting to read about what Mobile is doing. Uh, I would suggest that you take a look at that. And of course, they're in a very different situation than we are. Um, they have now gone from, I think, 47% minority to 51% minority. And so their council has tipped to where there's no longer, I think they have uh, seven, but there's now four minority and three majority uh, council members. But I thought the mayor made a very um, interesting statement. He said what we'll be doing going forward with the redistricting, they hadn't dealt with it yet, and obviously their election is further out than ours, um, is that at this point we'll be taking maps. Maps, plural. The city council will be looking at maps. The city council will be looking at maps, okay? And we'll be looking at those maps and uh, making some decisions about them. We'll be in discussion about it. That's a little different process than what we've been through here. And folks, I think it's the process that's broken that has gotten us to this point. Um, that's that's all I want to say. I, I think everybody involved here has excellent intentions and loves Auburn and wants to do the best for our town here and your constituents and I, I you know I, I just I, I think the process is I've been watching this and the process is broken. I don't know how we change it, but it's broken. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to the council tonight? I just said anyone else want to speak. Hi again. Billy Welburn, 112 North DeBart 11th Street, Apartment 5. I understand that there is a potential for a lawsuit, uh, presumably from the NAACP, and that the city attorney's office is doing their job, which is to advise the council and um, protect the council, the city, everyone from liability. Um, my assumption is that the NAACP has this tool in at their disposal and that they're willing to use that tool to ensure that Auburn gets a second majority-minority district. From what I heard when representatives came up and spoke tonight, they don't want to have to go down that route. And I know, um, I think it's safe to say uh, the city attorney's office doesn't want us to have to go through a lawsuit either, council members, everyone here. Um, so for that, possibility to exist and for us to respond to that possibility by saying, well, we're not going to collaborate because it could open us up to that risk, uh, it seems to be a bit of a self-defeating and self-fulfilling prophecy from where I'm looking. We live in the South. Um, we have a history of racial injustice. 
Um, and um, I think the tactic of protecting ourselves is, you know, speaking as a white person, we've had power in the system. The system's worked for us. Um, so in this way, the system can protect us, um, the council, the city, everyone. Um, and I think that if we were to take a leap of faith, so to speak, and say, hey, you know, council has advised us, it does put us at risk. Um, but to say, you know what, to take on a little risk to fight for justice of people who have not only had risk but had harm over our country's history, um, I think that would be a really powerful declaration to our city and the surrounding community that we want to make a difference, we want to be fair, we want to right the wrongs, and we're willing to take a risk and make that happen. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to the council? See you now. We'll have a move for adjournment. We got one more? Okay. I'm uh, Robert Wilkins at 261 Denson Drive. I want to talk about the ordinance uh, 3288 short term rentals. Um, I know that uh, y'all spent three years in developing the uh, ordinance, even though I've looked at the ordinance and it looks pretty much like the 1999 ordinance. I don't, I looked at it under a microscope and didn't, didn't see much difference. You voted five to three. One person could have uh, made it a, a tie and it would not have uh, passed. So I don't consider it an unanimous type situation. Um, some things y'all were mentioning today was uh, there was no statistical information about why not to have the uh, short-term rentals or what y'all call tonight the raw data uh, dealing with the redistricting. Um, it was pretty much uh, that I've noticed is it was four or five people in the community that objected to it. And they did such an incredible job of doing the uh, petition. They got like, what, 1,100, 1,200 uh, people. And of course, the way they did that was they were, they took uh, signatures from people who were in the lines at the different schools and said, do you want to know hotel in our community? I'm telling you, if I was in that line with my grandson and they asked me that, I would sign it in a heartbeat. I, don't, I didn't want any hotels, there's no way, okay? <coughs> Um, and also you develop a task force. I believe task force are, are incredible. There were five city related people on there and three non uh, affected citizens. There was no recommendation by that task force. I've never heard of a, a task force that had no recommendations. Uh, if you had included some people that were affected like me, uh, the 151 families that you said, uh, uh, you know, we, we were in violation of, of the ordinance. Uh, if, I believe you would have gotten some recommendations, probably too many to where you would have gone into election year. Somehow election years always seem to put people in a position of not doing a lot if it's got controversial things. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about, I've got bills here. Uh, you, you took away half of my income and you had no uh, validity to that uh, uh Thing. And Mr. Griswold, you have mentioned uh, about keeping us informed about the lawsuit cost. I, I don't quite understand when y'all uh, go to Birmingham to get your law firm. And uh, I don't know how much money it costs to go from Birmingham to here, but per hour it's pretty expensive just to come and, and show up. So uh, I, I don't quite understand that. And then uh, you, you um, I, I don't know if you didn't think there was... The uh, capability of the Auburn area that they should they uh, didn't wouldn't be able to handle this thing. I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning is. Uh, also, you've been asking for continuances that cost money. Why? Why would why would your legal counsel uh, do that? I just want to state that the ordinance 12 3288. Give me just one second. Uh, 3288 is taking away 152 families with uh, our constitutional rights. And I understand why. Can you wrap it up, please? Yes. Uh, why should we believe in the old, that old, dusty, 247-year-old document that is housed in the Philadelphia? It says, just we the people. 
Anyone else? Seeing no one. Move for adjournment. Uh, so moved. Second. Meeting adjourned.